Welcome to the third community forum by Iranian Americans for Liberty. My name is Reza Beruz, and I'm co-moderating this webinar with Dr. Shevan Pashandi. The topic for today's discussion is Iranian Jews, challenges after the Islamic revolution and anti-Semitism in today's American society. Iranian Jews are among some of the most accomplished in the American society and particularly in the Iranian American community. Their success has nonetheless come with a price and their story is bittersweet. The torment that Jews in Iran endured after the 1979 Islamic Revolution still haunts both Jewish and non-Jewish Iranian Americans. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting two distinguished members of the Jewish Iranian American community. Mr. Carmen Melamed, who is a, uh, who's a journalist and a community activist based in Los Angeles, and Mr. George Harunian, who is a businessman and a community activist also based in LA. Gentlemen, welcome. George, uh, you have been in the U.S. since the 1970s, early 1970s. Tell us a little bit about the uh, Iranian uh, Jewish community. What is the population of Iranian Jews in the U.S. and uh, what percentage of Iranian Americans are Jewish? First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity and I hope you'll have an informative uh, conversation. I congratulate and commend you guys for starting an organization called Iranian Americans for Liberty. Uh, there is no exact statistic as far as numbers. As you know, the numbers before the revolution were estimates of 80 to 100,000 in Iran. And the US census are not uh, very exact either. But from uh, judging from number of people who arrived in the United States in the 70s and our estimates of uh, you know, how many were there, uh, were here, I guess the community to be with the second generation of children born in this country to be about 75 to 1,000 to 100,000. Uh, what percentage of the Iranian community there are, that's also hard to say. I would say, uh, you know, more or less in the vicinity of 10%. I would say even maybe less because thousands and millions of Iranians left Iran and we don't know the exact numbers in this country. So that's what my estimates are. Most of the community, of course, are in two metropolitan areas in Los Angeles, Southern California, and in New York area, New York City and outside of New York. So uh, basically, I, I, I agree with you. And this is, this is uh, uh, basically a, a self-explanatory that the demographic of uh, non-Muslim Iranians uh, in, in the U.S. does not mirror that of Iran. In, in other words, if we say 1% of uh, uh, Iranians in Iran are Jews, it's, it's probably much more than that. It's probably somewhere between 5 to 10% of Iranian Americans being Jews. And of course, Baha'is in, in Iran, they don't declare so easily their religion. And so I uh, you, can, you can probably say that uh, anywhere between 15 to 20 percent of Ir Iranian Americans are non-Muslim by definition. I would, say so. I would say so, yes, I would say so. Uh, Carmel, uh, you are especially interested in the history of Jews in Iran after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Can you tell us very briefly how were they treated after the uh, monarchy was overthrown? Um, Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you to the Iranian Americans uh, for Liberty organization. Um, I think it's fantastic. You guys are um, providing a forum for uh, Iranian Americans and uh, others to learn more about the Iranian American community and, and who we are and what, what we truly stand for. Uh, the lives of the Jews of Iran basically were uh, devastated after the overthrow of the late Shah. Um, he, him and his father, the Halavi kings, provided a, um, you could say, a, a protection for religious minorities, especially Jews. Um, there was uh, a sense of belonging. There was a sense of nationalism uh, that 
the Jews in Iran felt and, and protection from the monarchy. And when the new radical Islamic regime of the uh, Khomeini came to power, uh, the Jews, uh, other quote unquote um, infidels, basically turned into third class citizens overnight. Uh, their properties in many cases were confiscated. Uh, their, their rights were taken away and they, they lived in uh, tremendous terror. Uh, their biggest fear was that they would be uh, tied and associated with Israel because they were Jews and you had thousands upon thousands uh, fleeing the country, leaving their assets behind. Sometimes many were arrested. Um, the head of the Jewish community in Iran, Habib al Qanyan, was um, arrested after returning back to Iran and in May of 1979 uh, he was given a 20 minute sham trial, accused of spying for America and, and Israel, and uh, summarily executed by the Khomeini regime. And it sent a very clear message to the Jews of Iran you are no longer welcome here. And uh, many believe that was the catalyst that, that caused Jews to um, slowly uh, leave the country. And, the community, which was, as George said, between 80 to 100,000 uh, over the last four decades has now been reduced to, uh, I would say, roughly five to 8,000 today because of that horror and terror that, uh, that they experienced. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, for, uh, I mean, it's very tragic uh, what happened to, uh, you know, fellow Iranians because of having a different religion. Um, after the Islamic Revolution. I'll pass it on to uh, Sherwan for, uh, for the next question. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending where you are. Uh, so my next question is uh, to George. Uh, what services uh, are, pro are provided by Iranian Jews uh, that have you, been, you have been witness to? Uh, what contributions have Iranian Jews made uh, to the American society and, uh, to, and to the Iranian American society? Uh, well, that's, a, that's, a, that. that's a very broad uh, couple of questions. Uh, you know, I came to America as a student in the early 1970s, exactly 1970, 50 years ago. So those of us who were students here and had already adopted or adapted to the country where uh, in the late 70s, basically a lot of us, uh, the ones who welcomed and tried to help uh, in acculturation and adjustment for all the people who had to leave Iran in a hurry. So I would say that the start of service, serving the community was more or less starting back there. We youth organizations and community organizations were for. So as far as servicing the community, our own community, because we were blessed to have been a community that had to take care of itself, when the community got transplanted, there were existing organizations who worked hard, of course, with the assistance of the American Jewish community to help the new immigrants. As far as the, your question regarding uh, what the Iranian Jews or Iranian American Jews have done in America, it was mentioned briefly in the start of the program. Uh, uh, you know, Iranian Jews have uh, believe, uh, I believe have done um, just like the general Iranian community have done much more than their numbers mean in business, in medicine, in education. I, as an example that comes to my mind that in Los Angeles, uh, 30, 40 years ago, downtown Los Angeles was a dead area. It was the Iranian immigrants and Iranian Jewish immigrants who came in and sort of revitalized the trade to South America, to Mexico, and then to the rest of uh, the country in the textile trade and other related trades. So uh, there are many examples of uh, contribution of Iranian Jews to this country. 
<clears throat> indeed. Uh, now the next question to Carmel. Uh, in Iran, they say that uh, they claim that Jews uh, live in complete peace and comfort and have a representative in the Islamic parliament or majlis. Uh, from what you have heard uh, from inside Iran, with the ties that you have, uh, do you agree with this statement? Uh, if not, uh, could you please elaborate why? <laughs> it's a joke. Yeah. It it's a propaganda ploy by the Iranian regime. Uh, I've, uh, I've said this many times as a journalist uh, from the Iranian Jewish community and the Iranian American community. Uh, the Ayatollah regime has ripped out a page of uh, the Nazi propaganda minister Goebbels uh, playbook. Um, they, the regime regularly parades out the member of parliament, the Jewish member of parliament, he's the regime's token Jew. And he goes before the Western media and claims that the Jews live uh, in a fantastic situation. They have equal rights, they have representation uh, in the parliament. But what he doesn't tell you is they live under duress. They have to say that they live in a good situation. Otherwise the regime is gonna come down on them. Um, what many people don't realize is when you have CNN or PBS or BBC or Western media that go to Iran and broadcast that the uh, Jews are living a great life and they live in safety, it's because those uh, media personalities have been vetted by the regime. They've been told by the regime, you have to speak to certain Jews, you have to speak uh, you can only ask certain questions. You can't go into certain areas. The regime provides its own quote unquote translator and protector. Um, those Jews that are there and claim that everything is great don't speak about the reality on the ground. And the reality on the ground is the anti Semitic activities that have gone on. Um, the most recently in March, we had an attack on the synagogue that's adjacent to the tomb of Esther and Mordechai uh, near the city of Hamadan. Uh, if life is so great for the Jews, then why was that synagogue uh, firebombed? Why didn't we hear any of that in our media here? Why didn't the regime uh, broadcast that? Um, another example was in February of 2019, you had two uh, Torahs. These are uh, Jewish uh, holy texts. It's the Holy Bible for the Jews. You had two antique holy texts inside of a synagogue, inside of the Jewish uh, ghetto uh, in Tehran, stolen in broad daylight. Why wasn't there any investigation by the regime? Why wasn't there anything in the media about it? Um, I would hearken back to 20 years ago uh, Mr. Harunian was involved in that campaign. Um, you had 13 Jews in the city of Shiraz randomly arrested and accused of being spies for Israel. They were facing uh, imminent execution. And if the uh, Iranian Jews and American Jews and, and, and the larger American community hadn't gone involved and interceded, they would have most likely been executed. So it, it's, it's really a farce. It's a joke that the regime is putting on for the media and its member of parliament is, is basically a, a, a stooge for the regime to put on a, uh, a show for them that life is supposedly great for the Jews, but it's not. And, and the last point I would add is if life is so great for the Jews of Iran, then why has the population, which was once 80,000 in 1979, been reduced to 5,000? And if life is so great for the Jews of Iran, then why do I have Iranian Jewish community leaders and activists repeatedly telling me as a journalist not to cover the anti-Semitism in Iran and not to talk about what the regime is doing to the Jews? They must be in fear and their situation of the Jews may not be um, in such a great uh, situation if you know things are quote unquote so great over there. Indeed, uh, there's a famous quote by the economist uh, um, Friedman, I guess, it's attributed to him that uh, the most genuine vote that people cast is with, with, with their feet. 
So when a community leaves uh, the Islamic Republic, it means they are not happy, they're voting with their feet. Uh, so you, uh, Carmel touched on uh, the bias in, in the media, in the, especially in the Western media. Uh, my next question is kind of related to that, uh, to George, uh, Mr. George Harunia. It's about the recent incidents. As you're aware, a prominent Iranian-born anchor <clears throat> or news host recently did a, a commentary comparing uh, Trump's presidency to the Third Reich on the 82nd anniversary of uh, Kristallnacht. Irrespective of one sentiment about President Trump, whether you're pro or against President Trump, do you think uh, that is appropriate to misuse the tragedy of uh, Kristallnacht to score political points or for propaganda purposes? Well, uh, I mean, that was, a, I would say, a shameful incident. Uh, obviously, it's not proper to compare President of the United States, no matter how uh, controversial he is or you, one doesn't like him, to a regime that killed millions and murdered children and uh, put people in uh, concentration camps because of their beliefs. Uh, it's, it's utterly unacceptable. Unfortunately, this shows you a couple of things. One is the state of political uh, discourse in this country. But more than that, uh, Mrs. Amanpour or Miss Amanpour uh, who has been a spokesperson, uh, a bridge for the Islamic re regime to American audiences through CNN and other media, uh, is not the first time that she is misrepresenting the facts. I mean, we all know that she's a, a regular visitor to Tehran and to the, has, she has interviewed uh, a lot of the personalities within the Islamic regime. And uh, she never asks the right questions. She always provides a platform for them to uh, give their lies. So back to the statement that she made, which I understand, she sort of half-heartedly apologized for it. This is not acceptable at all. And uh, you know, I know many called for her resignation from CNN, and uh, I don't think we can see that so soon. Yeah, I, I noticed, I, I did uh, read uh, uh, or, or listen to her apology. Uh, her statement, in my opinion, was insulting to both uh, Jews across the world and, brought, and, and also the, the, the United States, the, all the people, non-Jewish citizens in the United States. She did apologize uh, to the Jewish community, which was uh, the right thing to do, but she never uh, apologized for supporting uh, President Trump, uh, President Trump supporter to Nazis, because that's what she effectively did. And now uh, on that, uh, next question to Tar Carmel is, how do you, uh, how do you think uh, Ms. Christian Amampur's uh, comments reflect on the Iranian American uh, community in general, Jewish and non-Jewish. Uh, knowing that she is a relatively uh, well-known person in the Iranian uh, diaspora. Um, I, personally, I think her comments were shameful. Uh, as, a, as an Iranian-American journalist, uh, I, I was utterly disgusted. I think the larger uh, Iranian-American community is likewise shocked and disgusted that uh, she would make any comparison between the Nazi genocide and uh, the current administration in America. Um, you could say whatever you want to say about um... Hello? Uh, Carmel, are you there? We can hear you. I think something happened to his video or yeah, audio. Some technical issues. If, if uh, you don't mind, I like to, something came to my mind. Sure, sure, go uh, ahead. As far as uh, comparing anybody 
any regime to Nazi Germany, Christian Amanpour has the closest regime to Nazis and to fascists in front of her. She has never criticized the Islamic Republic regime the, uh, to Nazis, the regime that last year just killed 1,500 people and has jailed opposition and all that. But we, everybody in the world knows about this. She has never compared them to be as close as to Nazis as possible. And now we hear this from her. Exactly. The most uh, anti-Semitic regime in power in this day and age is the Islamic Republic. Uh, I don't think it's even up for dispute. So if you want to make an analogy, which is not appropriate anyways, uh, comparing any, any regime to uh, the Nazi Germany, but if you, want to make, if you have to make an, an analogy, basically, as you stated, Islamic Republic is the closest, uh, most comparable to the Nazi regime. Carmel, are you back? He doesn't seem to be back, so I'll propose the next question to George. Yeah, uh, I, I just want to make a comment on Mrs. Amonpour's uh, analogy, uh, which was, you know, I, I agree with uh, everyone on this panel that uh, it, it, was, uh, it was shameful. Uh, the uh, irony is that she questions uh, uh, the whole tragedy of Kristallnacht and misuses it to, uh, and mispresents it uh, to her viewers and uh, questions the uh, Holocaust in general uh, uh, by uh, extension. But uh, when she interviews uh, Hassan Rouhani, uh, she doesn't question how a, uh, a person who supposedly has a PhD in jurisprudence from UK doesn't speak a word of English. That's very interesting. Well, let's move on to the uh, next question. Uh, George, uh, there are some pro-regime Iranian American groups that uh, claim they represent the Iranian American community. And, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of some of them. And they, they've largely aligned themselves with radical Islamist groups and are frequently uh, seen associated with presumably anti-Semitic politicians like Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. Do you think that these people are doing any favors for the Iranian American community by uh, perpetrating such conduct? Well, I mean, uh, a simple answer is obviously not. But to, uh, to uh, explore the question and why is it that the different uh, Iranian Americans support uh, or somehow tacitly uh, cause the prolongation of the existing of the existence of this regime, I would say should be bro broken down to a few things. Obviously, there are people who get paid. I mean, there's no question about that. Uh, the, the rich country of Iran has been appropriated. A lot of money is being spent to lobbyists. And so that, 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 that's where the most obvious response. But I would like to go further. There is, uh, there is a lot of naivete, especially I would say, among the young Iranian Americans who are, uh, you know, born or raised in this country and do not have a clear idea or understanding of the, the regime. They don't understand that this is not an Iranian or pro-Iranian regime, but an anti-Iranian regime that rules over Iranians, denies Iranian culture, Iranian history, and divides the country uh, by religion or by Shias versus non-Shias and et cetera, et cetera. So they think, a lot of these naive people, they think that they are doing a favor to uh, Iran, they don't speak good Farsi. They have not visited Iran, but then they support Nayak or groups like that. Then uh, there is the political opportunists. We all know about the wave of pol politics in America. Right now we are uh, seeing the progressive, so-called progressive left uh, coming more to the scene. And we all as Iranians or students of Iranian history 
know about the alignment of leftism and Islamism. They come together, they see the world somehow the same, and they come together. And I see that in the left wing of the Democratic Party, the, those Iranian Americans who align with themselves with Ilhan Omar or uh, Rashida Tlaib, who are uh, not very happy to be Americans, especially Ilhan Omar, uh, they see that uh, you know, the imperialist, so quote unquote, uh, governments of the West are subjugating the, the poor Middle Eastern uh, people. So therefore, that's where they see. And unfortunately, this is the challenge of the Iranian Americans who want to uh, cause change in American foreign policy and in, in general, in a change in the way Americans are, uh, see Middle East and Iran. Okay, it doesn't look like uh, uh, Carmel is uh, with us still. Maybe he has yeah. some technical difficulty with his go. computer. Well, I ask his question, um, you know, to you again. Okay. Uh, do, do you think that, in your opinion, do you think like groups like NIAC, in particular, who are who are claimed to, for years, have been claiming that they represent the Iranian American community at large, and that's how they present themselves to politicians when they when they meet with them. Do you think that they're inherently anti-Semitic? Well, you know, uh, I, I think the first part of the question that you asked was responded to my previous comments. Uh, you know, I've seen NIAC operators uh, on, uh, on uh, interviews. They speak perfect English. There are a lot of educated people like the people who have gone to State Department or White House, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they don't speak good Farsi. They don't understand Iran very well. Obviously, uh, the people who run NIAC are well-financed, well-paid, and that's what they do all day long. Are they inherently anti-Semitic? Now, here's the question. Anti-Semitism has to be defined in this uh, in this uh, situation. For many, anti-Semitism is anti-Jewishness, anti-Jews. The definition of anti-Semitism has changed. We all know that. Uh, it is no longer only being against Jews or Judaism. It is the, the, the enmity towards Israel and uh, Israeli people. That is the more broad and the more def definite definition of anti-Semitism today. Are these groups denying, uh, like Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, the existing, uh, existence of Israel? Obviously, yes. Are they uh, for uh, uh, pressuring any way they can? Uh, you, know, you know, for example, a very good example was this peace accords that uh, President Trump was the main uh, force behind it between Israel and uh, the Emirates and Bahrain and now Sudan and Chad uh, are coming in. Uh, th these people were against it. Ilhan Omar was against it. Uh, so therefore, uh, when you align yourself and we know of Iranian Americans who are very close to her, or uh, uh, then we, we, we say to ourselves, we ask ourselves, what is it that they are doing there? What is it that they see in Ilhan Umar or Rashida Tlaib that uh, sort of aligns with their way of looking at the world and looking at the situation? That's, That's uh, th thanks for the comment. That was very comprehensive uh, 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 the two, uh, uh, clarify what anti-Semitism exactly entails. Uh, uh, and does that include anti-Zionism? Is anti-Zionism uh, uh, anti-Semitism? Yes, I mean, in today's world, uh, as you know, uh, there is a new uh, international definition of anti-Semitism that many Western countries have uh, adopted it. And they when they, when they, you know, in Western Europe or in Eastern Europe, even 
this is the, when the governments want to sit down and discuss how to deal with anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, which means denying the Jewish people having the right to have their own country is a, a form or the highest form of anti-Semitism in today's world. Yes, the answer is obviously yes. George, uh, because of uh, regimes lobby groups, uh, namely NIAC uh, in the US that mirror the Islamic Republic's doctrine of being anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist, and as well as being openly hostile to organizations like IPAC, many Iranians feel that the once friendly relationship between them and the Israelis have broken down uh, tremendously. Uh, you tend to tweet a lot about the services uh, uh, provided by Israel in development of development and is industrialization of Iran before the revolution. Um, as you very well know, Iran and Israel were, were at once close allies. How do you think we can rebuild that trust and uh, amity between the two communities? Can the Jewish Iranian American community be a catalyst to uh, mend those uh, fissures that have been created by uh, the pro-Islamic Republic uh, uh, groups in the, in the United States? Yes, uh, you know, the question that you asked is very much close to my heart. Uh, as a community activist, as somebody who was born in Iran, raised in Iran, and after 50 years in this country have continued to, uh, uh, you know, keep in touch and follow what happens in Iran and Iranian literature and so on, uh, I can say that there is no question uh, Iranian-born Jews who understand the culture of Iran, who know Iranians, and uh, obviously have belonging and respect and love for Israel, are and can be, as I said, are and can be catalysts and bridges of understanding. Now, let me add to this uh, statement. Right now, you have young Israeli Iranians, Israeli Iran Iranians who went to Israel when they were very young. I mean, we all hear about musicians and uh, uh, all those uh, Israeli Iranians who still after 40, 50 years play Iranian music. But there are programs right now on, on internet from the Israeli side. I can say this with certainty because I am in touch with Iranians within Iran who long for friendship and are beyond, beyond the propaganda of the regime and the centuries old uh, teachings of uh, anti-Semitism, I would say. They are beyond that. They have graduated these ideas. And today, I would say is the perfect time after 40 years of experiencing this regime, uh, Iranians have come to the point that look, who is our friends? Who should be our friends? And they know that there is no enmity. There is no, uh, there shouldn't be any uh, uh, fight between these two great related cultures strategically Iranians and Israelis are very much at the same uh, direction. Now you look, I want to give you a couple of examples. We all know Iran is a country that has always had, had uh, earthquakes. All over the country it has been devastating earthquakes. A few years ago, during this Islamic regime, a few years ago, there was another earthquake in Kazvin, Kazvin as we say. A lot of buildings were destroyed. A couple of buildings stayed. Those buildings were the buildings that Israelis built 50 years ago or 40 years ago to do agricultural projects in, uh, in Iran. That's an example of the relationship that the two countries had and can have. As far as the role of Iranian Jews as I said, those of us who are in America speak English, speak Farsi. Those of us who are in Israel who speak Hebrew, speak Farsi. 
are and can be catalysts. We love to do this. I have done my share, personal share of introductions and making connections. As you know, we are living in a small world now and anybody can travel to Israel, anybody can go online and see Israel and obviously Iran, if it opens up a little more. So to make a long story short, uh, there is no question that Iranian Jews have to be and can be and are bridges of friendship. Uh, I want to close with this. I want to mention these guys. There's a few guys who have started Israel-Iran Friendship Society. They are not in in United States, but they are in Iran and outside of Iran, and they are not Jews. They have started this thing, and right now on Twitter, they have like 2,500 followers. So I guess that means that means a lot. That's okay. what I Thank you for, for that comment. Yeah, I believe that there should definitely be a solidarity between Iranian Americans of, uh, of all faiths and all uh, ethnicities. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, looks like uh, there's, there's a uh, Ms. Mandana Zan Karimi uh, uh, has a question to raise her hand. Oh, okay. Uh, can I see the question? I see here. Yeah, I see. Um, I see a raised hand, but I, I don't see the question. Um, but maybe, maybe it was a mistake that uh, she raised her hand. Yeah, I'm. I'm looking at a couple of questions that I saw. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, Carmel is back. Oh, Hi. Carmel. Is Sorry, back. we we, hey, we lost no the connection there. Hey, no problem. Um, so, uh, so uh, the, some of the questions that we're going to pose to you is that uh, you know you you were you were talking about uh, uh, Christian Amanpour, uh, and uh, and you, you were as, a, answering Sherwan's questions. Uh, uh, the question that I was going to pose to you is that you know, uh, and, uh, and George answered the first part of it was that there are uh, pro-regime Iranian American groups that uh, have aligned themselves. Uh, the, with Islamist groups such as CARE, and they, they, they're often seen in association with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, politicians who are ostensibly anti-Semitic, okay, such as Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. Uh, what do you think of, I mean, do, do, do you think that, uh, uh, first of all, do you think that these uh, people represent the Iranian American community knowing that uh, about 10 to 15 percent of Iranians or Iranian Americans are Jews, and these people are uh, associated themselves with anti-Semites. And uh, do, does, does that uh, does this kind of conduct sit well with the Iranian American community? How does that reflect on the Iranian American community? Uh, I would say those uh, those pro-regime groups uh, like NIAC uh, do not represent the larger Iranian American community. Um, they have no religious minorities in their group. Um, I have yet to see an Iranian Jew, uh, an Iranian Baha'i, an Iranian Christian in their organization. Uh, there's a very sp uh, famous Spanish proverb that says, if you wanna know someone, see who their friends are and when you have these pro-regime groups like NIAC associating themselves with uh, anti-Semitic uh, organizations like CARE and uh, members of Congress, un unfortunately, that make anti-Semitic comments and anti-Israel comments, uh, it speaks volumes. I think the larger Iranian American community uh, has a tremendous amount of uh, love for one another, love for people of all faiths, uh, people forget that for generations, for many, many years, uh, Jews, Christians, Baha'is, Muslims, Zoroastrians uh, lived side by side in, in, in Iran. There were periods of um, difficulty and intolerance, but for the most part, and you know, within the 20th century and, and within Iranian Americans here in the U.S., 
been a tremendous amount of love, camaraderie, um, respect for one another and friendship. And this group, NIAC, or these other pro-regime groups don't represent our community, in my opinion. Um, because from what I've heard from the vast majority of Iranian Americans, they have no hate for Israel. They have no hate for Jews. Uh, they have tremendous amount of tolerance and respect for one another. And in reality, these, these groups like NIAC are, are really on the fringe when you speak to average Iranian Americans. They don't represent us. And they're, unfortunately, they're shame, shamefully claiming that they do, but they, they are not a representative of the larger Iranian American community. Do you think that these groups, like a group like NIAC is anti-Semitic? I wouldn't say they are overtly anti-Semitic, but when they endorse candidates that are anti-Semitic, when they remain silent, when the Iranian regime spews out Holocaust denial garbage, uh, when they say nothing to members of Congress, uh, such as the Congress member in uh, Minnesota, um, who's, who make these anti-Semitic comments, it, it speaks volumes. Um, their silence is, in essence, their endorsement of a lot of these uh, comments and, and activities by the regime in Iran. Okay, the I other question, go, go ahead, George, I wanted to mention. Sorry, yeah, uh, sorry. I wanted to just add something here to what everybody is saying. Carmel just said it. And that is, uh, although I 100% agree with uh, you as far as their re representation of the general Iranian American community, there is no question that uh, groups like NIAC have been more effective in the uh, in American political uh, halls of power than uh, the uh, the silent majority, let's call it silent majority in a sense. I would call it the unorganized silent majority and hopefully the move by uh, you guys uh, will come to that point that we can call it organized. Uh, you know, I mean, having people in the White House, having people in the State Department, uh, frequenting White House uh, over 30 times or whatever, during Obama, the, these, uh, you know, they, they, they were effective. They were effective. Although we, we concur that they were not representing a lot of Iranian Jews, so, so the Iranian Americans. So therefore I would caution everyone that uh, let's be realistic and let's talk about how to counter that. Thank you, George. Uh, uh, Carmel, uh, uh, when you were uh, having technical difficulty, I asked uh, George about uh, you know how can we mend the broken relationship that uh, between Iranians and Iranian Americans and uh, and Israelis and the state of Israel. Uh, you know, as you very well know, the, 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 these two countries were allies at, at one point, close allies at one point. Do you think that the Jewish community, Iranian American Jewish community, can serve as a catalyst to uh, to uh, rebuild that relationship that once we had, uh, you know, that has been a bit basically uh, has been destroyed by uh, uh, pro-regime uh, uh, propaganda groups such as NIAC uh, uh, and uh, has basically because of the conduct, of course not because that represents the sentiment of Iranian Americans. Do you think that the Jewish uh, Iranian American community can help in that, in that aspect? Yeah, absolutely, Doctor. I think they can serve as a bridge between uh, Israel and, and Iran. And they had in the past, uh, under the Shah, uh, Iran had de facto relations with uh, Israel. And those folks that were uh, involved in trade, in commerce, in cultural exchanges, uh, in agricultural help, 
uh, in medical exchanges many times were Iranian Jews. Um, let us not forget that uh, we all, and by we, I mean Iranian Americans, we have a tremendous bond with the larger Jewish community and with Israelis through uh, the founder of Iran, Cyrus the Great. Uh, if you look at the Holy Bible, uh, the Jewish Torah or the Holy Bible, you have Cyrus mentioned many, many times. He is revered. He is beloved. Um, that is a common factor that no regime can ever take away. That is an ancient bond. That is an ancient friendship that has endured through the centuries. Um, and this regime in Iran today is just a footnote. Uh, I would add that uh, both Iranians and uh, Israelis have continued that relationship uh, indirectly through cultural exchanges online, through um, activities outside of the Middle East. Uh, you have uh, a nonprofit organization called Israel Aid right now. It's a, it provides humanitarian help to refugees uh, that have fled their countries in the Middle East and have set up uh, temporary residence on the Greek islands. And Israel Aid is a group of volunteer Israelis that have gone to these Greek islands and they are helping Iranians. They're showing Iranians on that island and worldwide that they have no animosity toward the people of Iran, that the regime is separate than the people. Um, I think if, if we as Iranian Americans highlight that, highlight the friendship that uh, endured in the late 50s all the way to 1979, and also highlight the ancient friendship, um, the bonds will very quickly be renewed uh, between uh, Israel and, uh, and Iran uh, once this regime collapses. Thank you very much, Carmel. Thank you, thank you, George. If you have um, any final comments, uh, I think we have uh, some questions. No, go go ahead. Do you have a question? Have uh, questions in the Q and A section that we can address. Okay, go ahead. You want to address them, Sherwa? Uh, sure. Uh, Adrian Kalamel asked. We have uh, or commented. We have talked a lot about NIAC and other groups. How about uh, academia? Example, the Valley Nasr. Um, so, uh, Karma, would you like to address that? Uh, I'm not sure how to respond to that. I, I think that um, in the world of academia, you have a number of apologists for the Iranian regime uh, for whatever reason, uh, they want to ignore the regime's humanitarian uh, abuses, the human rights abuses. They want to ignore the uh, anti-Semitic activities of the regime. They try to sweep under the rug the Holocaust denial. Um, it's prevalent in, in Western academia, U.S. academia, as it is in uh, the polit political realm and, and in the media. Um, I think the best way to combat it is with truth. Um, the best answer to uh, some of this garbage is to expose uh, the falsehood and, and to set, set forward the facts. Indeed. Uh, Jason Cohen uh, uh, has a question. Uh, Thank, thank you for the great talk. As a young uh, Iranian-American Jew, I unfortunately see a larger portion of my peers embracing the pro-regime and, and the hard left views. What particularly do you think uh, can be done to get your message out uh, to the younger generation? So George, if you, you mentioned that, you touched on that, like second generation of Iranians, uh, sometimes naively, uh, embrace the, the hard left views or, or uh, pro-regime uh, lobbies narratives? Uh, what can be done to, to reach out to that? Well, I mean, continuing on what uh, Carmel was saying, uh, you know, uh, 
as Americans, as Ameri we are by choice all Americans, we live here, we feel the issues of this country, and we all know uh, that a uh, lot of what has happened uh, or is happening is because of universities. Uh, the universities is where a big uh, arena for countering ideas. We all have heard this statement and I want to uh, again mention it and support it that the academia in America is more or less dominated by the left, more or less dominated by the left. The, uh, uh, you mentioned in your talk, Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman passed away 25, 30 years ago, I think so. And he was a spokesman for, I don't want to call it right or left, but for people who respected freedom of choice and uh, not the government interfering in daily life of people. But in our particular case, I know that one of the biggest challenges of American Jewish community is countering anti-Israel propaganda in the college campuses. Same goes for the Iranian American community. I mean, we, we talk about American policymakers discussing uh, how to deal with the Iranian regime. And we all know that the, the, if the incoming the government is going to be uh, the Democrats, Biden and Harris, they're going to be talking about how to negotiate with this regime, how to make sure they don't have nuclear power so much or their ballistic missiles and so on and so forth. What, what is not the factor, what is not in the, maybe in the bottom of the list is the way they treat Iranian people and the way they talk about Iranian history. I mean, Carmel mentioned Cyrus the Great. We know that, I mean, we should propagandize this issue. These people deny Cyrus the Great. They, they, they talk about him in a very negative way. All the, all the, uh, I mean, I would say there is no question any Iranian should be proud of Cyrus the Great and Darius the Great and what they did in history. I mean, there are examples of human rights. Somebody who conquered other people and treat them, treated them fairly and told them, go and do whatever you want to do. So I again want to reiterate that the challenge for the Iranian American community is to pr present the proper narrative, not let Christian Amanpour, Walid Nasr, or people like that define what are the issues. And as I said, it's a big, big challenge. It's, not, it's easier said than done. It needs money and it needs professionals who all day uh, give their time to this. This is the model this is the model that uh, how uh, political and educational issues have been resolved in America through professionals and through money. I mean, uh -huh. indeed, uh, on that, actually, Miss uh, Mandana Zan Karimi uh, has made a, uh, I, I believe, interesting comment uh, regarding how to reach out to uh, second generation. Uh, of Indian Americans, uh, she says the parents of young Indian Americans should talk to them and teach them. Uh, and I, I think a lot of wisdom that can go from one generation to another, especially in the situation that, as George and Carmel pointed out, basically uh, uh, academia has turned into, and, and broadly speaking, our generation, our, gener our educational system has turned into uh, brainwashing and, and propaganda machines uh, for the hard left. Um, I think that the wisdom needs to come from older generation, from parents, grandparents who have firsthand experience or the, as the social justice warriors would love to call uh, lived experiences. I'm not sure if there's any unlived experience, but anyways. Uh, so uh, 
when 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 the hard left brainwashes uh, children and let's say portrays the regime uh, in a humane way the ones who suffered firsthand and have the quote unquote lived experience they can uh, they can bring a lot of value uh, by transferring their their experience to the next generation mr hillel newman uh, says uh, Hi there, I'm following this uh, interesting conversation, thanks. In relation to the question about the Israel connection, just wanted to state that Israel has always made a clear distinction between uh, the regime and the people of Iran. Israel sympathizes uh, with the people of Iran who have been taken hostage by this uh, hostile and malign regime. Israel tries to maintain open channels of connection with the people of Iran. Uh, I would like to ask how uh, you think Israel can send further message of, messages of solidarity uh, to the people of Iran. And Hillel Newman is the Council General of, General of Israel in LA. Yes. So, diplomat. Yes, very nice gentleman. And I'm very happy that he's watching this uh, conversation. Uh, so, uh, Carmel, would you like to answer that? As an Iranian, uh, I think it's uh, what they're doing right now is uh, is on the right path. They need to continue. Um, you have uh, their own social media platforms that are uh, putting out information in Farsi language to the people of Iran. I think that's number one. Uh, you had Prime Minister Netanyahu on many occasions. Um, provide messages to the people of Iran with uh, Farsi subtitles. I think that was very effective. Um, you have uh, Farsi language media outside of Iran, like Iran International, uh, regularly broadcasting uh, news reports objectively from Israel. I think that's very important. Uh, I would emphasize that uh, Israeli society, you have a lot of uh, Israelis who are of Iranian heritage, um, they should uh, step up and share their experiences, uh, their musical, uh, cultural exchanges, uh, their, their love of Iranian heritage uh, with the people of Iran. So folks can see firsthand that there's no animosity, there's no hate. Um, there's actually a lot of commonality and friendship that needs to increase from a people to people basis. Uh, obviously you have, uh, uh, that radio Israel with, uh, Manasseh and Amir, those kinds of programs, I think will help, uh, build the bonds and, and make stronger bonds. Okay. Indeed. So I think we went through, uh, yeah, there's a comment from Adrian Kalamel, spot on, it's pervasive. I'm a college professor and constantly fighting a wave of anti-Israel sentiment. So as George and uh, Carmel pointed out, unfortunately, uh, hard left uh, ideology and, uh, and anti-Semitism and, and coalition with Islamists unfortunately go hand in hand. Uh, they aligned themselves closely back in 1979 Iran, uh, the communist and Islamist uh, anti-Shah groups, but that was not an isolated incident. In today in the States, uh, uh, today United States, we see that coalition, unfortunately, and, uh, and uh, we have to fight them both. Uh, there's no choice uh, but to do that. So uh, I think we covered all the questions and, and comments. Uh, so um, any uh, closing comments? I think we covered everything, right? Well, there is a, uh, I mean, we mentioned a few important subjects. I, first of all, I wanna thank you, Dr. Behruz and Mr. Fashandi for uh, providing this uh, podium. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think that as we all uh, thought in the beginning, there is a lot of commonalities of common interest. A free Iran is going to be good for 
not only Iranian people, but uh, for the people of the uh, region and for the people of the world. We all know that a lot of the troubles of the world started with the uh, so-called Islamic revolution. Uh, and I do not want to sound discouraging. I didn't mean that. I just wanted to mention that there is a big challenge in front of us. Uh, we just have to concentrate on this and work to affect American uh, political uh, narrative through our connections as you guys are doing. And in turn, with our actions, help the Iranian people do what they need to do. And that is our role. I appreciate again and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you uh, to the panelists for attending and uh, dedicating your time to this uh, to this panel. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Join us for uh, next community forum uh, sponsored by Iranian American community. Thanks to our panelists and for the uh, thanks to the audience. Good day. <laughs>